I'm a council member for Ward 5 in Washington, D.C., and I serve as the council's chair pro tempore, as well as the uh, chair of the council's committee on business and economic development. And I've been on the council since 2012. Today, I have the privilege of moderating this conversation on the future of urban agriculture and the opportunities it presents for entrepreneurship and addressing gaps in access to healthy foods across the District of Columbia. I'm gonna start by presenting a few uh, a brief opening thoughts uh, to frame the conversation, then provide a quick run of show uh, and some brief introductions of our esteemed panelists. Uh, a few weeks ago, I attended uh, an unveiling of UDC Grown, which is a new state-of-the-art agriculture part housed at UDC's Bertie Backus campus in Ward 5 uh, on South Dakota Avenue. This pod is a sustainable vertical growing environment that can produce food year round with a significantly lower environmental footprint than traditional farming techniques. So after seeing and learning more about this new technology, I was immediately struck by uh, the potential applications for district residents, uh, particularly in communities that lack access to healthy foods and need more entrepreneurial opportunities. I also had the pleasure uh, not too long before that of joining uh, Ronnie Webb and Green Scheme on Earth Day last month at Langdon Community Garden to learn more about uh, his work and the economic opportunities, environmental factors involved in urban farming. Uh, the, the more I learn, the more I am really uh, convinced that urban farming is another tool uh, that we could be considering uh, in terms of the district's prosperity, making it more widely accessible and addressing the really serious challenges, uh, the food desert issues that we've confronted in the District of Columbia for quite some time, uh, particularly in underserved parts of our city. So I, I really look forward to, to unpacking these challenges in more detail with the help of the panelists. Uh, now I'm gonna introduce uh, those who are gonna be joining us on the panel and give them a chance to provide some uh, brief opening thoughts before we dive into some of the questions that I have uh, we're going to discuss the questions that I have for approximately 20 minutes or so and then uh, turn to uh, the audience, the folks who've joined us uh, on Facebook Live and the folks who are on Zoom. Uh, you can put your questions in the, uh, the comment uh, area if you're on Zoom with us and then uh, you can also do the same for Facebook Live. We're going to try to answer uh, as many questions as possible. So we really want you all to be involved in this discussion. So Ronnie Webb. Uh, he's the president and co-founder of Green Scheme in Washington, D.C. Uh, Ronnie is a D.C. native, fellow D.C. native, and, and stands at the forefront of educating disadvantaged communities on environmental stewardship and community revitalization. From developing and implementing USDA food system projects to consulting on behalf of businesses and organizations to adopt more sustainable methods, Mr. Webb, over 10 years of experience in the environmental sector. He co-founded the Green Scheme in 2011 after realizing the lack of environmental awareness that existed in many communities. Fueled by a desire to impact the way people think about their health and their environment, this vision for the Green Scheme is to organize, educate, and empower communities. Ms. Webb has brought to life hands-on educational programs such as Girls Gone Green, Code Green, and the Corner Water Project. And I've had that water and it's great water. Uh, among his partners are Dreaming Out Loud, the United States Department of Agriculture, the District of Columbia Housing Authority, and Broccoli City. Falani Africa is a multi-creative artist, film producer, director, uh, and horticulturist, born and raised in Washington, D.C. She spent countless summers down south on her grandparents' farm where her love for plants and green life was nurtured. As a filmmaker, she's directed and produced award-winning international documentary, uh, how you pronounce this? Maestrina? They, I don't, y'all should have put this okay, in. Maestrina. That was close. Maestrina okay. La Favela. Okay. All right. I'm going to get my staff. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, they should have put that like in some. <laughs> uh, I appreciate it. Falani's travels throughout the African diaspora and family traditions have been her main inspiration for growing food sustainability. Uh, for growing food sustainability. As a way to share her passion for culture, and sustainable living. She has curated gourmet produce boxes that incorporate snacks and self-care products. Recently, uh, Falani co-founded Elevated Tea Company, an organic CBD tea company dedicated to bringing wellness and relaxation through the ritual of tea. Che Axum is the director of the Center for Urban Agriculture and Gardening Education at the University of District of Columbia. 
uh, my alma mater. He leads a team of researchers at UDC's Firebird Research Farm located in Beltsville, Maryland, and oversees UDC's Master Gardening, Sustainable Urban Agriculture, and Specialty and Ethnic Crops programs. Uh, Mr. Axon worked for the USDA Agricultural Research Service Plant Sciences Institute for 20 years. He taught middle school science and is a successful farmer and sustainable farming consultant. He's a graduate of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources at the University of Maryland. Also, he is a certified uh, nutrient management consultant for the state of Maryland. Mr. Axum is a member of the American Society of Agronomy, the Crop Science Society of America, and the Soil Science Society of America. I'm gonna now uh, turn it over to the panelists to give some uh, introductory remarks before we start the discussion. Uh, Ronnie, we're gonna start with you. Thank you. Um, just, a, just a pleasure. Um, I appreciate the invitation um, to be here. I can nerd out and talk about urban ag and, and community public health all day long. So I'm just excited to get into it. Um, I come from a, a really grassroots approach, um, but we are, you know, very organized and executing. So excited to share my knowledge of what's going on in DC and excited to hear what other panelists have to offer. All right, Falani. Greetings, everyone. Um, thank you so much, um, Councilman McDuffie, for inviting me. Um, I'm excited to meet Shay Axum and Ronnie. Ronnie, I've heard so much about you. So I'm just honored to be here, you know, amongst other DC natives to discuss, um, you know, how we can reclaim um, our land and spaces, you know, to grow. It's a lot of food deserts in our community. So um, this discussion is very imperative. So I'm very happy to be here. I appreciate both of you uh, giving those brief openings. We, we, I think, lost Shay momentarily. He looked like he was outdoors somewhere. So hopefully he has <laughs> a connection and he can rejoin us. Um, but in, in the meantime, we're gonna start with, a, with an easy question. Uh, Falani, you know, my introduction talked a little bit about uh, your family and, and the farm and, and uh, perhaps uh, how you discovered uh, agriculture. I want you to expand a little bit about that and talk about uh, really that moment for you where it hit you that it was something that was going to be involved in uh, your life and, and that you were dedicated to the point that you are today to do it. Sure. Um, well, you know, as like a lot of DC natives, a lot of our families came from um, the Carolinas, you know, and down south. So um, on my block, I remember, um, you know, my neighbors, some of my neighbors was, would grow in their backyard. So I was not only exposed to going down North Carolina, like to the real country, you know, to farming, but there was urban, you know, agriculture happening, you know, on my block, on Harvest Street. So. Um, for me, naturally, you know, those summers down south, you know, as a kid, it'd be all slow and you'd be thinking about the city and missing a corner store and missing uh, so and vinegar chips and just missing popsicles. It's just all the city stuff, you know. And so um, as a kid, I would just be anxious to get back to the city. But as I became an adult, I really appreciated though spending that time you know on the farm shelling peas picking peas you know with my cousins and eating fresh cantaloupes and watermelon and tomatoes you know so um and back then foods were just so much more natural you know so for me um i realized also a lot of people don't know how to cook with fresh ingredients mm -hmm. you know so Back in 2015, um, it's a urban, it's a community garden in my neighborhood, but the waiting list is so long. And um, there's, it's, I would say the garden is really white and in the sense of how um, they act like it's a community garden for the public, but they act like it's this secret, you know, garden. Mm -hmm. So it's, it was kind of hard to get in and I got in and so um, I just started, you know, growing my own food with the help of my father who remembered what he learned, you know, farming and growing up in North Carolina. So um, I just started to do it and the food tastes so good that I just became like addicted to growing so that I can, 
eat, you know, nutritious food and not have to spend, you know, much money, just right. buy seeds, right. you know, plant it. So uh, I would say that's how my um, love to do it for myself and sustain myself began. Sure. But I would say that it's like in my genetics and DNA, you know, um, to grow, we've, we've cultivated, you know, this land for centuries. So um, that's it. Yeah. No, I appreciate yeah. that. I appreciate that, Ronnie. So, so you've been doing this uh, professionally for a while, but but you know exactly when did you discover urban agriculture and and, and really what the possibilities are uh, and what it means for you? Um, okay, cool. So my my story is is kind of ironic. Um, I went to Gonzaga. I played basketball. I went to Gonzaga my ninth grade and tenth grade year. And while I was at Gonzaga, they had a special program come through from the architect of the Capitol where they paid you up to get a job, right? And so this is mm -hmm. the first job I ever had. And so I was one of those people selected out of Gonzaga to go. And they threw me in the- um, when, when, were you, when were you at Gonzaga, if I might I ask? Um, I graduated eighth grade at 2000. So I was Got all the way, okay. um, I was there from 2000 to 2002, my freshman and sophomore year. Okay. And so um, <clears throat> while I was there, um, I got this summer job through the architect of the Capitol, only mm -hmm. offered to Gonzaga students. And they threw me in the botanical gardens and I hated it, right? Everybody else was in the Longworth building. They was in the, uh, the Rayburn. They was all on Capitol Hill, catching the underground Metro, yes. going to eat lunch, man. And I was out in this place by myself. So I, I requested to get transferred and they transferred me to the um, to the paint shop. And so I did paint for a year, but I stayed through this program my entire high school, even after I left Gonzaga. And I ended up, the following year, they put me to National Arboretum. And which, well, the reason why I bring this story up is because I hated it, right? I was like a laborer out there. They had me like, I was in the boxwood collection, which is like these shrubs. Man, it was, um, I had me digging ditches and trenches and had me, um, cutting grass and just doing all this stuff that wasn't, I, I didn't feel like was the cool part of it. So it really deterred me off. Fast forward and I graduated from school with our walls, uh, ended up coming back, graduated from school with our walls. And I remember going on my um, college application. I'm like, man, I always know I want to do something in business. So I'm like business manager, business management, oh, all my application. For North Carolina a and the school that I eventually ended up going to, the second major that I picked was agriculture economics. I remember looking at school where I was, I remember sitting at desk like, I don't even know what this mean, man, but this sound like some money, check. All right, <laughs> fast forward, I get to North Carolina a and and business management is full. They throw me in agriculture economics. And so um, when I went to ag, when I went there, man, just the, 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 my advisor, the classes were small. For me, somebody who was still just trying to get through, mm -hmm. make it through college, mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it fit for me. And so that's what sort of, um, and as you fast forward it now, um, once I graduated from college, I came back home, you know, I applied for a hundred jobs at the USDA and I didn't get one job. I didn't get one interview, you know, and just luckily growing up, I had a mentor and an internship I did in high school, the school that I was, he, he had a nonprofit. So I took what I had been exposed to and what I had on paper and just wanted to make it make sense. I always knew you could help people and make it your job and get paid. And so I think that's what sort of got me into the um to this. That's a, that's a unique experience. That's a unique uh, introduction uh, to urban agriculture. Che, uh, we miss you for a minute. We're glad you're able to, to, to come back and join us. We, we were talking about just uh, people's early introduction uh, or whenever the introduction was, whether it was early or late uh, to urban agriculture. Like what, what, what connected you to uh, this, this, this industry? Uh, uh, was it early for you? Was it later? I know you worked at USDA. Ronnie couldn't get a job there, but but, but explain to us when you uh, got introduced to it. I don't know if you're talking, Che, but we 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 can't hear you. You're muted. Okay. So can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it was later for me. I I was headed straight for a pharmacy and. Um, I, worked, I got a chance to do some pharmacy tech work. I was getting ready to go to Howard University for School of Pharmacy. And then I just took a break for a while. And I was, uh, I ended up at the uh, United States Department of Agriculture, Agriculture Research Service in Bellsville, Maryland. So um, then when I got there, I found out a little bit more about ag careers. 
uh, University of Maryland was right down the street. So I said, well, hello, let me check this thing out. Mm -hmm. uh, I always kind of wanted to do some stuff different that nobody else was doing. They had this cool thing called agronomy. I said, wow, agronomy, that sounds cool. I have no idea what it is, but let me <laughs> check it out. Uh, went there, got back in, uh, got my degree in crop and soil science. And um, uh, a little later, I mean, I was 30 when I went, almost 30 when I went back to well, 28, 29, 30, but I went back to University of Maryland to get my degree in agronomy. And um, uh, a little older than most of the students, but had a, had a true drive to really kind of just soak up the knowledge and um, started started farming around that time too. I started up a, a organic farm in Jessup, Maryland, started up another organic farm in um, Upper Marlboro, Maryland, and just kept going on. Didn't have a lot of uh, mentors. People told me I was crazy going into agriculture. They said, why do you want to do that, man? So we're trying to get away from the field and far. So I said, well, I don't know. I just, just what I want to do. Uh, uh, George Washington Carver, 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 huh? Carver, Carver, strictly him. Just reading everything I could about him, finding out what he did, how he thought, how he walked, how he talked, everything, you know? And so that was my, that was my mentor. Okay. So, so look, 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 I want to go back to something you said, Falani, um, and this wasn't one of my prepared questions, but, but I want to unpack it a bit, right? This is part of the reason why I really want to have this conversation. You said in the same remarks in, in, in your opening that your introduction uh, both started sort of young in your family's connection to down south, my family, three of my four grandparents from South Carolina, although we didn't spend time down there. And so I really didn't have that experience early on. Uh, although Mr. Uh, Reverend Davis had a garden out back of my house, mm -hmm. um, it's no longer there, but it was like the center of my little community over there. And, and, and he grew tomatoes and things like that. So I did see it early on. We had, the Spencers had a peach tree. Uh, there was a guy who we called Mr. Cherry. I don't remember his last name, but he had a cherry tree in his mm -hmm. yard. You talked about that early experience. Yeah. You also talked about the, the, the farm, the community uh, garden that exists in your neighborhood that you felt was really white mm -hmm. and you couldn't get access to it early on. And so I want to kind of unpack that a bit because, you know, part of, I think what people's experiences are, are similar to maybe what your experience is, right? Maybe they don't have access to information. Maybe something pops up and there's a community garden. Uh, they weren't aware that it was coming and they don't feel like it's for them. Um, and, and maybe they do, maybe they're part of organizing it around it. Mm -hmm. How do you all feel that agric urban agriculture is viewed by people who live in communities of color in District of Columbia? And, and, and do you think that they understand the benefits of having these types of community gardens or programs at uh, University of District of Columbia uh, or, or having, generally speaking, the city invest in these types of things? Do they understand the benefits? Well, no, I feel like um, this is why what Ronnie's doing is so important, the environmental awareness, because no, they don't understand. I don't even think they, they, they look at it, process it, or see the value in it. They have a lot of, a lot of people in the hood don't even know what certain vegetables are. You know what I'm saying? And this is not exotic stuff. It's a lot of people that tell you, oh, I don't eat that. Then you say, have you tasted it? Nah. Then it's like, how do you know if you like it? You know, so, you know, people, they don't even know that they don't know. And then the way the urban, um, you know, gardens are set up, it's a lot of the gentrifiers, you know? So it's a lot of them out there. So when you look and it's just like, okay. But I, I was just looking like whatever, but it was my dad who kept saying, you need to grow your own food. You need to do it, you know, because the way he grew up. Yeah. So finally I signed up and I got in there and it's interesting because black people kept saying, oh, that garden is racist and this and that and that and that. But the way I am is like, I'm just going there to plant and do my thing. Like, I'm not trying to befriend, you know, nobody if you speak, whatever. But I, I realize the energy in the garden is as such. So a lot of people don't even sign up mm -hmm. because they like that energy is weird. And then I realized the amount of people that I would attract when I was out there, Black people and Latino people, they would come up to me. They probably been walking past the garden wanting to ask, oh, how do you get it? But 
the way the white people act like it's a secret garden, mm -hmm. they're intimidated to even ask them. So I've met a lot of people who come up to me and ask me, how do you do it? And I've even made change because I tell them the website to sign up and I've had to check the, the white folks in the garden mm -hmm. with their behaviors. You know what I'm saying? Because sometimes they act like they don't know that they don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and I check them. I tell them. That you think it could be that they really don't, though? I mean, because because on the same token, it, 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 where, where is the garden? If you don't mind me asking, which it, one are you in from? Highsville in the historic district of Highsville. Yeah. But, you know, I thought I thought that I tried to give them the benefit okay. of the doubt. Like maybe right. they don't know that they don't know. Right. But these are adults with children. And I realized I, I come into the garden. Right. Mm. I go to the shed. It's a cold to get in the shed. I'm getting shovels and all that. Mm. I go in, my parents told me to speak to people when you enter. Okay. Speak, these people, I, I know they heard me, and seen me. These people look at me like, like a ghost just walked in the garden. Got it. No, okay. no speak. Got it. So I analyze if a, another white person come in the garden and speak, it's all speaks. Okay. So I said, bingo, okay, it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Then okay. some other incidents came right. about some other incidents came about in the sense that these people just grow food to compete. They don't eat it. So the community, black and brown, go into the garden and take food, right? Okay, so that's, pro okay, yeah, that's a problem because technically they're not supposed to do that. But for me, I feel like it's food going to waste. It's a community garden. Like, why are y'all having, it? you creating rodents it's causing infestation and all types of stuff and mm -hmm. ruining my crops because you got tomatoes falling on the ground and waste. Right. Right. It's, it's just, it's the garden, gardening in the urban garden, it's showing me how Chris, Christopher Columbus thought, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And how their behavior is over, like they, they think that this land is this, it's not, it's the cities. Right. And then their whole approach of greed to grow and not even pick well, let me ask you. Let me ask you a question about that. I, and I want to get I want to get Ronnie and Che in on both the perception issue that I that I asked you earlier, um, because I want to hear their feedback. But then I want to follow up on, on on what you just said, Felani, about growing and picking and whether it's being eaten or it's used strictly for a competition. So, so Ronnie, Che, uh, in terms of how you all think people of color perceive, um, you know, urban agriculture, and in particular the community gardens that exist across the city. What's your experience on how they perceive that? Yeah, Ronnie, I'll let you go ahead first. Okay, and hey, good to see you again, Dr. Che. Yes, sir, brother, this Che, this Che is cool. All right. <laughs> yeah, all right, cool. <laughs> cool. Filani, definitely a pleasure just being on, just being yeah. on the um, panel, which uh, y'all are saying some great stuff. Um, I'll give you a, a, a prime example, uh, council member. McDuffie, Langdon Garden, the garden you was just at, right? We had an event. It was majority African Americans there, right? I had it. It was another event that was organized last weekend where it was not majority African Americans, right? So you got these communities where, and you take the Langdon community, it's been suffering through some violence, right? It's going through some gentrification. Um, so when you look at this particular community and all these communities, are similar, but have details that change. So you got to pay attention to the small details. But when you're dealing with a community like Langdon and that garden, across the street is a senior building right there, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of those seniors are from down south, have deep agricultural roots. So you mm -hmm. ask how does the black community perceive that? They they are excited and eccentric about getting it, but mm -hmm. they're seniors. And so they have a, a lot of them have, um, technology issues as far as being tech savvy. Yeah. So when you're sending out the sign up and it's a waiting list for the Langdon Garden, two year waiting list. So when you're trying, when you're a 70 year old senior, 80 year old senior, and they telling you, you got to email so-and-so and you got to type this and you got to mm -hmm. do that. And then it's a two year wait, That that's an issue, right? And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, th so those are some of the things that we try to address is like, making sure we meet people where they are and getting the information and the resources out but that's one thing I just want people to think about. The second thing is, Falani, I think mentioned it earlier, but it's, it's like so many, it's public safety things that go on. Um, it's, and it's also the messenger. So if you have, um, say, new residents in the community who don't typically look like the old residents, 
and they're saying come out to this garden, come out and participate in this. <laughs> and you not from this community, nobody knows you, you have no track record or history in this community, you're not somebody of influence of a voice, then you know it's gonna be hard for you to connect with the direct community. Not right. only that, not just that, um just not just that, it's it's you know, it, it is a stigma about getting dirty. You know, a lot of the kids, and see, and that's what we try to change is, you know, the kids come out, I go get the kids from Langdon, I get the kids from Lincoln Heights, in, anywhere, DC public schools. And, you know, half of them might be wearing Jordans. Mm -hmm. So then you got to figure out ways to get them to get out there. And these are small issues, but mm -hmm. when you pay attention to those details, I think that's where you sort of have major success in getting, um, the kids, not just commit the kids, intergenerational, um, yeah, intergenerational sort of uh, energy put into that, and so you know, and that's just a part of it. But there are minor details. Another thing is this: this is the last thing I leave it at. Is I try to do all of our community gardens that I want them to be fully accessible. So at Lincoln Heights, I have twenty-one fruit trees. We have a community garden. Um, a lot of these gardens are not gated in. When you have look at Langdon, which is it's a DC Department of Parks and Recreation um, sort of partnership and, and, and agreement to get those those spaces activated. Um, you know, those have gates and combinations, so it doesn't feel really welcoming opening to the community, but it protects the personal gardeners who want to grow their own stuff and don't want people really meddling with their stuff. So I think a big piece of it is understanding, and Langdon Garden is really special, council member, so I want to commend y'all on just the design with that and Josh Singer over it. Um, DC Department of Parks and Recreation because we actually have half the garden designated for youth programming, but then the other half of the garden is designated for private um, for, for private residents or private community members to actually utilize that space. So knowing what type of garden you're putting in there and having it um, or urban farm garden, whatever you want to call it, and have it make sure that it is sort of designed to fit that community, mm -hmm. um, I think leads us to success. Jay, what are your thoughts on, on these issues? Uh, I know it's a lot to, to, to sort of unpack, but, you know, I do, you know, talk to, to, to people sometimes and I ask them about it, right? We, we just invested 20 million in, in, in a new rec center in Edgewood. Uh, it opened up to great fanfare. It has an indoor gymnasium. It has a new field. Um, obviously, the pandemic has been going on for more than, uh, you know, more than a year, but they also have a, a, a garden uh, right outdoors on the roof. Uh, I was there, uh, was it last week or maybe the week before, uh, you know, working with the folks uh, who manage the rec and who, who, who runs the, the, the program for DPR. Uh, he cut me a, a fresh head of romaine lettuce right from the ground. I took it home. And so, I mean, I, I wonder if people understand that these things are for them or, or do you think, Che, uh, sort of like Falani mentioned and to a certain extent, uh, Ronnie mentioned, some people don't see these community gardens and programs that are funded by DC government necessarily for them, or they're not, perhaps just not getting the information. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's a big informational gap, you know, we, uh, so I believe, you know, what Ron and Polani said, you know, that this is an information gap and then there's some attitudinal issues that we're dealing with, but um, it's an informational gap. So we just need to get more information out there. Uh, you know, one of the things, you know, urban agriculture is a, has been a very good friend of mine, but I, I've kind of into it, but kind of growing beyond that. And, and I'm growing beyond it in the ways to deal with uh, the concept that I really have become to appreciate more is a concept called urban agroecology, which has more of a social aspect of it and a um, more, uh, I guess, a um, equitable, equitable balance as far well, as- Break that resources. down for us, because you said urban agro- Ecology. ecology, yeah. Uh, if you look uh, it up, urban uh, agroecology, that's that's the future for cities. I mean, so we're going to still do urban agriculture. We're going to do a lot of urban agriculture, but when we start getting into urban agriculture, there's a lot of kind of nonsense with which it, it can't get into that box because it's boxed okay. off already. Whether you're trying to do uh, genetically modified organisms, bad pesticides, uh, you know, sewer sludge, or those all those things are already boxed out. They can't get into urban agroecology. If you just look at the term agroecology, look at that. And so once we get into that more and just start educating younger folks on it's going to take a generation thing. Because if yeah. you talk to most, most young people now, you know, they know 
five, six, seven, eight. If you ask them about smoking cigarettes, they'll tell you, ah, smoke is bad. And there's a reason for that because a long time ago, they had a huge campaign to just educate young folks and people in general that smoking might not be that good for you. We're gonna have to do the same thing with the food system. Mm -hmm. and, well, and do it quickly, quickly. That's, that's a great point. But, and I think it sort of ties into um, this notion of whether, and this is a question, right? I don't want y'all to think it's loaded or not. I mean, the reason that you all are on this panel in part is because, you know, I, there, there are things that are happening that the district government is investing in. And, and I think, you know, some of these investments uh, are really wise investments. But I think that given the multi-layer challenges that exist for people across the city, particularly folks who've been here for a really long time, they might see a uh, community garden or investing in urban agriculture is something for new people and not see it for themselves. They might see a bike lane as something for new people, even though they ride a bike, right? They might see, you know, a dog park is something for new people, even though they have dogs and they walk their dogs. And so I think part of this is just how are people perceiving the investment that the city is making? Are they see, seeing these investments as something that is important to them? I think they are important investments. I think these investments are something that transcend race and that, and that you know, people should see themselves in a community garden and, and be able to grow you know, their own food, understand uh, where it came from. Uh, perhaps it adds to the value and what it means for them and perhaps they can take that message on and maybe they'll decide not to you know, spend money on certain other things that might not be as good for their health. I think the education component is absolutely important. And so, yeah. Um, the investment that the city is making, I think is an important one. Is there something more that the city could be doing to really increase access to information about these types of things? Do you all think that people know where all the community gardens are, where, where are the opportunities to, to learn about what UDC is doing? Uh, on this campus and maybe if there, there, there are spaces for community to get involved in it. I know when I went up to, to, to the event a couple of weeks ago, uh, Che, uh, y'all talked about like, you know, going before the ANC and the ANC had taken a vote. And so clearly you all are engaged in the community, uh, but I still wonder if people understand the impact of what Falani's doing, the impact of what you're doing, the impact of what uh, Ronnie is doing, uh, you know, in Lincoln Heights, no less. Right. I mean, most of the times people don't hear about the good things that are happening in Lincoln Heights. They only hear about what's happening in Lincoln Heights when it comes on the six o'clock news and it's associated with violence. And I think uh, I'm curious for you all to talk about, um, you know, whether there are, are gaps in, in what the city could be doing to better promote um, the opportunity in this space, both to have access to healthy foods, but also perhaps there are entrepreneurial opportunities that, that people can avail themselves of. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think I think the panelists that we have are so great because we it seems like we're all aligned, but it's, it's also d very different perspectives because it's going back to the environmental awareness. And then this, I love this, the urban agro ecology because people are forgetting the social aspect. It's all about being relatable and identifying. Just like people walk past my garden and see all them white people, they don't say anything. But when I'm out there, I get bum rushed with the questions, you know? So it's about identity. If even with education and pedagogy, like if you can't relate, I, I started a, a project called, a workshop series called BB and Carter G, Benjamin Banneker and Carter G. Right. And so I, I started up Coolidge at the Outer Space Labs. I've been up there. At first, the, the youth are like, oh, I don't want to get dirty. Next thing you know, in about three minutes, you can't keep them out the dirt. And I realized one of the other instructors just wanted to start and just talk about the, um, what was the system? The hydro system he had going on. And I said, no, we got to break things down. So I started off by asking them, what vegetables do y'all like to eat? What's your favorite vegetable? You know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Y'all like smoothies. You know, you have to do icebreakers, as they call them. You know, you have to, like, as Ronnie said, meet people where they are. It's a huge gap. 
it's a gap in knowing what to eat and eat healthy. You know, we have diabetes. You see the DaVita all over our hoods, the dialysis. Yeah, right. But you can't even find it. And when you do find a grocery store, the produce looks so bad. This is why people don't even know what it is. They walk right past it because the system, the, the capitalistic and racist system drops off bad produce at our grocery stores. Mm -hmm. So it's not even appealing, you know, so that the awareness is key. And we have to, at this point, we have to go to the doors and meet these people where they are. You should, see, you should see the youth at Coolidge now. Y'all can go to my Instagram and see Bird's Nest Box. They all over it. I'm, I'm going to go to your Instagram, but I'm also going to uh, try to coordinate with you so I can stop by and see you all at work. I, I love to see uh, uh, see you at work. I, I got a chance to see Ronnie with, with a bunch of folks over at Langdon, and I, uh, and I got a chance to see Che at the event. So I'd love to come uh, come see what you're, you're working on, too, for Lonnie. Let me ask about misconceptions. Uh, I think some of what I'd like to accomplish is perhaps dispel some misconceptions about this. And, and part of it is that this is just something for new people, right? It's not just something for new people, right? I mean, it, it is, you know, it is something that you all are doing. And Falani, uh, I believe you you grew up in the district. Ronnie grew up in the district. Che, I thought you told me you grew up in the district too, right? Are y'all natives? All three of y'all natives? Third generation. There you go. Uh oh, okay. There you go. So we got a whole panel of native Washingtonians talking about urban farming and agriculture. I think that that let, we, we might be just be dispelling the misconception just in the uh, the the sort of um, imagery of what what this panel even looks like, and I think that's important because I I would imagine that people don't even associate you know people that look like y'all doing what you're doing in this space. So are there other common misconceptions that people might have, whether they're new or old, whether they're young or, 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 or are, are well seasoned? Are there things that you think people should understand about this industry and what you all are doing and the investments the city is making that would help, I think, better tell the story about the importance of this work? I, I have one about for the young folks. Okay. Um, and this is more like on the entrepreneurship or the workforce development side. Um, but I've often, I told you my personal story of not being able to uh, get an interview with the USDA, right? Now I talk to the USDA like they're my best friends. Mm -hmm. And they tell me that they have a lot of issues with getting people of color. Do you know who can recommend? How can we get people in our internship programs, our fellowship programs? How can we connect a little bit more? So what I wanted, and not just them, the EPA, Department of Energy and Environment, um, you know, Department of Parks and Recs even have, you know, have um, park specialists, uh, National Park Service, or um, people that do the water. I forget, I can't think of the top of my head, but all of these are careers. Um, even, you, you know, all the UDC hiring all the time for their, um, their causes, agriculture program. So I just wanted that, and not just that, that's the job side, but the entrepreneurship side, food production, um, food manufacturing, distribution, um, <laughs> you know, you just name it. I'm just farming, um, you know, just specialty crops. It's a bunch of niche markets, edible, edible flowers. You know, edible flowers are very lucrative yeah. um, in the city, you know, and these are things that kids or people in our community, the Cottage Food Act is another one, you know, and so these are opportunities to be economically stable uh, mm -hmm. within our immediate community. And so I just wanted to bring that, you okay. know, make sure that's- any, any, any other misconceptions or, or anybody want to talk about any hurdles or barriers to entry? If somebody's interested and wants to get involved and wants to start to grow their own food, are, are there things that, that you know, they should be mindful of and perhaps the government can help out with? Are there hurdles to really doing this? Um, I, I want to touch on the misconception piece. Please, because please. Us as African-Americans, we, we got to go back to that line. I think a few of us talked about it, about that whole thing about getting dirty. Mm -hmm. See, because we toured the land so long for so many generations for free, 
a lot of us, you know, have this thing, they don't want to get dirty. So it stopped at our grandparents' um, generation. Okay. Because a lot of a lot of us moved to the cities and got you know you feel me? So the whole notion of toiling the land sometimes is traumatic to some black folk. You know what I'm saying? So they don't even like connecting being out there in the field to them is just like they may think like, oh, I'm going back in the time. That's why the the that social piece is important and studying. Um, George Washington Carver is Shayhead. I uh, see we have all come on, Benjamin Banneker wrote okay. the farmer's almanac in the 1700s. See, this is what we do. You understand? Right. Benjamin Banneker was a descendant of the Dogon, you know, from West Africa, astrologers, all of that. So this is what we do. All so right. we have to get back to it and then teach that. We have to meet That's people where they are and teach that. That's all. You have to just meet people where they are. We can't even approach it with all of these fancy words and stuff. We can say them because we know them, but we just have to practice the urban agroecology. And, and expose do the, folks to, to do it. The intergenerational. And then you saying about the funds mm -hmm. and investments. They said, uh, Muriel, the mayor just, what well, is all these millions for outdoor learning. That needs to be going to these organizations like Green Scheme, the Outer Space Labs, Guerrilla Arts, you know, my company, we need to be out there. I sell organic seeds now, you know, like it's so many aspects, like Ronnie was saying, that can be touched. But without the awareness and meeting people where they are, we we want to get lost, you know. So that's all it we have to bring us back to our roots and and get down mm -hmm. to earth as simple as that. I appreciate it. Yeah, I would I would definitely, definitely um concur on that so Felani, thank you so much for that bright wisdom so yeah i mean you know when i i've been writing a book now i'm almost finishing the book but it, it talks about the the origins of of sustainable the key word is sustainable urban agriculture because there were other cultures which kind of maybe started agriculture but they were not sustainable we created we us created the first sustainable agriculture for 3500 years in our valley civilizations sustainable for 3,500 years. We were the first. We were the first. There was no other sustainable culture that lasted as long as the culture that we created in our valley civilization, Black people. No mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. So, so I, you know, I didn't get to hardly have my questions, but I, I feel like I, I'm burned up a lot of time with my, my questions. And so I want to I want to turn to to some of the folks who've joined us um, both on Zoom and Facebook Live. And I, I think I'm turning to, is it, is it John or Silas? And, and uh, I got John, Silas, and Malcolm on my team who've been helping me. Thank you for that, guys. It, 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 one of y'all gonna facilitate yeah. the question, Q&A? Yeah, council member is Silas. Um, so there were a number of comments um, that were in uh, the chat and folks were really happy about the conversation. Uh, and so I wanted to uh, just read a few questions from the chat and then we'll transition to Jonathan who will be uh, reading questions from the, the Facebook uh, live as well. Uh, uh, the first uh, question is from Micah Avery. And the question is, how would Mr. Axum suggest a student at UDC, uh, the community college, start get, uh, getting involved in agricultural experience before they transfer to the main campus, especially during Corona? So given the limitations with Corona, a student at UDC Community College, you know, how can they get that agriculture experience before they transfer? Can you all hear me? I can hear you. I can, but okay. I'm not sure if Che is frozen or not. He has not moved in a while. <laughs> Uh, he, he jumped off. So we'll come back to that one. Uh, okay. Ronnie, okay. the next question is for you uh, with respect to Langdon Garden. Uh, uh, Jeremiah Montague Jr. Uh, wanted to know if you had reached out to the ANC or the ANC commissioner in that area when you faced some of the hiccups that you may have faced. No, I, I didn't. Um, I believe uh, God, um, the way it's set up is I'm a nonprofit, so I'm a, I'm the community partner. 
for that particular garden and a couple of other other sites for DPR that are like urban gardens. But each set of each set of those gardens have a group of managers, usually one or two, that are community members that help orchestrate and facilitate between the private plots. I believe they go and do that. Me being so embedded in that community, um, I was able to sort of liaison um, between DC Department of Parks and Recs, the seniors that were having issues, and uh, um, some of the new members of the, of the garden, the gardeners out there. And, and the, the quick issue was about throwing meetings at on a Sunday when the seniors could, knew they weren't able to make it on Sunday due to church for the most of them. And, but that was the only day that was available for a lot of the professional people who came in, uh, newer residents in the community. And so I just took a little bit of liaison, but that's why it's good to have sort of like a neutral partner in there to sort of, um, you know, try to address those things as soon as possible so everybody can collab and work together. But the, but the ANCs, um, in my experience, have been super, super helpful in getting a lot of this, a lot of the urban ag projects done, um, connecting the dots. Um, it's a lot with these urban gardens. There's a lot of partners sometimes that come to play. It may look like it's one person or one organization, but it may be three or four. It may be a government agency, a nonprofit, a community group, a church, and so on. Um, you know, you, you know. So, but the ANCs are, 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 are definitely people that can make it make sense. But I didn't for that particular site. Okay, so uh, Ronnie, just real quick, we'll, we'll make sure to make an introduction between you uh, and the folks who serve in the ANC roles uh, over in Langdon. Um, I want to jump back, uh, Shane, now that you're back on, uh, there was a question for you uh, related to UDC's community college and a student, you know, a prospective student at the college looking to get more agricultural experience before they transfer to the main campus. You know, how would you suggest that they navigate that, especially during a coronavirus period? So you may be on mute. Let's see. Yeah. No. Is that question for me? I'm not on mute. It is. It's for you. Okay. Could you repeat it again? Sure. For a prospective student uh, looking to transfer from the community college to the main campus, uh, and they're looking to get in uh, right. get into agriculture, uh, what, how would you suggest they navigate that? I would contact. There's a there's a brilliant young lady we have on our staff. Her name is Miss Marshall Hailstock. H A I. L S T O C K at udc.edu. I think Marshall is M A R S H E L L E dot Hailstock. Contact her and she will put you in touch with the right uh, people to get in touch with so they can get connected to what we're doing. Okay. And she just put her information in the chat. So for those that are on the Zoom side, you should see her, her information in the chat. Oh. All right. Thank you. Um, from Sharice Muhammad. Uh, she serves as the LSAT chair of McKinley Tech. She would love to talk to you all, but her question is, um, how can McKinley Tech get involved in this work? The school has expressed interest in community gardening and she wants to be able to collaborate, if not with all of you, at least one of you. But I've yeah, done some work at McKinley yeah. Tech too. So they, um, excuse me, I've done some work. So part of what I did, and that's why I say it's a lot of people that are often involved in these urban ag projects right now. And part of the answer, to go back to uh, Councilman McDuffie's, one way that you can sort of get people to, to do more is double down. That's that these programs are working uh, from the community gardens to the to, to programs like Produce Plus, all these food accessibility programs are working once it's a closer scope um, when people can really put a magnifying glass on it. But there are, um, at McKinley Tech, I've worked with a group of students through the I think they were called the Green Zone Workers through the District of the Department of Energy and Environment, but it was a summer youth employment program that sent their kids through the District Department of Energy and Environment. And we were able to educate them over the summer once a week, um, giving them food justice and urban ag classes. Um, but that was not connected with the immediate um, normal day school, right? And so my experience with these schools is in order to get a project like this really going, you need the, really the principal, is one mm -hmm. person that um, you really want to have connected to the project. If not the principal, somebody who's dealing with a club, um, maybe the science teacher or anybody who's dealing with after school programs who's sort of like a liaison, but it all comes down from the head. And if you're having some problems, 
communicating with the principal. There's a guy named Sam Eulery, um, who is the director of school gardens for Aussie. And Sam, that whole program, um, Aussie has a school garden program where they're connected and they have liaisons within the school that can make that communication a little bit better. His name is Sam Eulery, it's probably sam.eulery at dc.gov. I can't confirm that. But if you look up Aussie, O-S-S-E, um, school gardens, um, they, it's a, a whole bunch of resources right there uh, would help you sort of like navigate that, that landscape. Um, CM, just uh, as a checkpoint, we've got about five other questions that have been asked. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a heads up on that and I'll be reading the Facebook ones as well, just for- Okay, I know two of the questions were related to things that, that I was gonna ask. Uh, one was about space and, and the other, I can't really see him. I'm having challenges navigating some of these questions, but then one was about, uh, well, some, somebody mentioned um, just the limitations regarding um, um, feeding residents at scale. Uh, they asked that the council is gonna do more to invest. I'm open to it. I just, honestly, I, I need to hear what the concerns and what the challenges are. Uh, and so I would love for you all to speak to the challenges if they exist, it sounds like they do. Um, that was a question I plan to ask about space to be able to do this and to do it perhaps at a scale um, where you can feed more residents where there are gaps in access to healthy food. Unless y'all don't think there are any challenges with space. I'm talking to the panelists. Oh, well, space is always a problem. You know, I mean, space in, in DC, real estate is just at such a premium. So but we're just gonna have to allocate certain spaces. Um, Kate Lee uh, over at Department of Energy and Environment, they're working on those kind of aspects of just finding more space where we can, where folks can grow more food in DC. So we're helping with that. Uh, this person, if I could jump in, because I want you to respond to this, uh, Che, or, or anybody else as well, but I want to specifically finish the other part of their question. They, they talked about investment more heavily in ag innovation, hydro, aquaponics, CEA, I'm not even sure what CEA is, vertical farming, et cetera. I know what I saw on UDC's campus in that partnership with PEPCO uh, and, the, and, the, and the university was really innovative and cool. Uh, I imagine it's a challenge in terms of finances, but like, could, so could you all speak to, to, to those aspects too? Uh, you know, hydroponics, aquaponics, CEA, tell me what that is. And then, and then. I, I guess the C, CEA may be controlled environment agriculture. I okay. think that's what that is. And okay. so uh, all of that's, you know, we have some excellent folks on our staff. I mean, uh, Mr. Thomas uh, Sweets over at our back facility who runs that so we have a lot of opportunities for people to learn more and um, I think as we learn more and people start asking more questions and asking for this funding to become available I mean it, it should be uh, become available I mean we have to explore all the opportunities whether it be soil-based agriculture or soil-less agriculture we have to examine all these possibilities as far as um, looking at uh, addressing food and nutritional security in the District of Columbia okay and then uh, Silas, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump back to you and John. I know there's some, some. I think you all mentioned Facebook Live has some. Yeah, um, some yeah. So, so there was a question on Facebook asking, um, how can community members build food co-op opportunities? And I'm assuming that's specifically in, in the District of Columbia. Well, one resource I'd like to mention, um, is there are a lot of, committees and a lot of groups man like um one of them i sit on is the a food policy DC's food policy council um where there are working groups that are working on issues just like this council member you mentioned commercial kitchens um there are a lot of there are a lot of uh working groups it's an urban agriculture sub working group um through the dc food policy council who are working on these things as far as co-op specifically um i remember that it was a working group I want to say about one or two years back, ran by Johnny Eisenberg at the Department of Health um, that had a group specifically on uh, food co-ops. There's also a group called, the, um, I want to say the Ward 8 Grocery Co-op, which is another one. So what I would encourage um, folks to do is to see who's already out there, what working groups and committees are already out there, um, what coalitions sort of exist. Um, go and, and network in that space and see what's there. And, um, you know, and just see what you can come up from there. 
uh, from that. And that, that would be my recommendation. And there are mm -hmm. people working on that space. The Food Policy Council meetings that we do monthly is a great place to um, sort of raise that question and see who else is in that space that, that is working there. And those um, Food Policy Council meetings usually have 75 plus to 80 attendees um, present there before COVID and, 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 and during COVID, they're still really, really active. So just throwing that as a resource out there. Sure. Um, so CM, we have a, about two more questions. I'd uh, say jump in and, and, and uh, you know, we want to keep people, I always like to only keep people for an hour in their, in, their, in their evenings, but let's see if we can get to both of them if possible, Silas. So we'll ask sure. to keep their answers brief. Indeed, indeed. So uh, there's a question about um, if you all have identified or if you think there should be priority areas um, that should be focusing on supporting urban agriculture, including access for residents, supporting farmers and businesses. So that, that question, I'm sorry, is actually for DC government. So for UCM, do you think that there's some priority areas that DC government should focus on with respect to urban agriculture? You know, honestly, I'm not the expert in this. I, I would say this, I think we need to, you know, it's funny that, that I think both uh, Ronnie and, and Filani have said this phrase tonight, meet people where they are. I mean, it's something I've been saying you know, as long as I've been in this position, but more especially during the pandemic, um, when we talk about vaccine equity, when we talk about, you know, ways to meet, to invest in people uh, and the resources, making sure they reach the people who are in benefit, we, got, we need to meet people where they are. And so to answer that question, although I can't really answer as an authority on urban ag, I'll say that we need to do it uh, in areas that make it easy for people who need the the, the healthy food options the most to access it, right? To, to, to access it. And so, so I would say we should be trying to look at ways to do this in places where there are you know, food deserts, for example. We know in parts of the city, uh, especially in parts of wards five, seven, and eight, uh, that there, there are more challenges uh, to access healthy foods. And so uh, looking across the District of Columbia, regardless of what the ward is, uh, to see where uh, healthy food options are least accessible and trying to invest in areas around there, particularly if it's a government-owned property, right? I like the way we've used the Bertie Backus Campbell in partnership you know, with UDC. Uh, I like the, you know, what Jan, uh, Ronnie's doing at Langdon Park. Uh, Filani's doing some amazing things, it sounds like, up at, uh, around Coolidge. And so I, I'm not an authority to say we should do it here, here, and here. I would say more broadly, we should intentionally do it in areas where uh, the gaps exist the most. Okay. All right. Um, there uh, is a question. Uh, Cheryl Dixon wants to know more about the phrase food co-op. So can that be, uh, can that explanation be built out a bit? Can you explain to her what a food co-op co actually is? That, that, that can't possibly be, to me, who is that to? No, no. <laughs> you gotta call somebody's name, one of these experts. So Shay, how about you? Go ahead, Go ahead, Lonnie. No, that's for you, Shay, you can answer it. Okay, no, I'm not, uh, my, my vision of a food co-op, I mean, and you know, the, we have to get more into the culture part of it. We, we got the agri part down, but the culture, people working together. That's the culture part of agriculture we need to be probably better at. And so, for example, we have a, uh, we got a food garden at Backus. You know, um, there was an ag pod there. There's hydroponics, aquaponics, native plant nursery. Then there's a food garden there. So we have to get together to just people just concerted to effort to just grow different types of food. And then some of that food they're going to take home, of course. But then some of that food probably needs to be donated to a cooperative effort, you know, a cooperative growing effort and cooperative kind of saving effort and distribution effort or even a selling or economic effort and that could be done with gardens all over but it has to be a logical kind of thing that people wrap their head around that okay i'm not just growing food for me and my family here i need to grow food for me and my family but yeah i'm going to grow a little bit maybe five percent of what i grow is going to go back to the community to sell to market in a cooperative situation that's the way it should work that's the culture part of agriculture sure sure so cm we have one uh, question, but after that question, I want to just read a few of the comments. I thought there was some. Go ahead. Really go ahead. Let's go ahead and do that, and then we'll wrap it up after that. Thanks yeah, that. sure. So the, the last question uh, was uh, about, you know, how can agencies 
contract the folks on this panel. There was one person on Facebook that said Falani so authentic, right? And so they think that, you know, her, her authenticity would really, really help uh, with these gardening education programs, uh, such as the uh, Benjamin Banneker and Carter G program that she mentioned. So, you know, what, what is the process for the panelists and also other people that, you know, may be interested in working with DC government? So I, I'm guessing if, if any of you can speak to your experiences, specifically Falani and, and Ronnie, since you all uh, have had opportunities to work in the district. Um, well, I'm actually looking for more opportunities. So that's why I'm glad that this is coming up on a panel because I'm working under a, a arts organization, um, Guerrilla Arts, who's been in, doing arts stuff in the community. But this whole Outer Space Lab project is really amazing. And we're in five schools. I'm just kind of focused on Coolidge and I can't recall the the other schools, but I would love to take no. this EB and Carter G workshop, you know, over the city. Of course, it would need, you know, investment to get materials and tools and, you know, things of that sort. So mm -hmm. maybe that's a good question. I'm not <laughs> sure yet how to navigate <laughs> the, the government, how I can work with you all. But right now I'm working with organizations that I've already had, you know, affiliations with. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have we have funding lines. So I'm definitely going to contact with you. And um, also, I've always wanted to meet uh, Ronnie and to have the opportunity. So I'm going to definitely contact with you and um, see, okay. if, you know, what role UDC can help assist, you know, you with that. That's, that's what we're here for. Okay, wonderful. We just, we, we just have had, we have not had the opportunity to meet. Okay. And yeah, and I said, I want to study under you. So this is just really divine, you know, and Ronnie, we, we just all going to get together. I can see it this summer. So I look forward to, um, you know, learning more and coming together on how we can access. As somebody said, the authenticity is real. That's why the urban agroecology is important. You know, we have somebody else commented and talked about the stories. We have to do, be relative, you know, to people. If it's not relative, like you said, they're going to think it's for them. People look at the bike lanes like that's not for us, you know? So we have to yeah. really be relative. It's about authenticity and being relative. If, if not, then that's just like these teachers coming from Idaho going into DCPS. They can't relate to them kids, no. you understand? So we have to really, it, it's about being uh, relative and relatable. Yeah, so. I, I think that, I think you're absolutely right, Falani. I think that concept really transcends uh, urban ag to other spaces, including policing. And we don't have time to get into it, but I think I've heard that any number of times. And I know from my experience growing up, sometimes you have folks who don't culturally understand what it's like to be black in an, in an urban environment, in a city. And so that cultural competency uh, is very important uh, in this area, in urban ag, as it is in so many other areas across the city. So I appreciate that. Silas, you wanted to, to do, I think, uh, some comments as well? Yeah, just a handful of comments. And, and, and this is really more so for the folks uh, to just hear what's being said. We don't have to necessarily respond to these, but I just want to put it out in the atmosphere. Uh, there was one person who stated that they would love to see the city create positions and prioritize native Washingtonians, especially in the agriculture space. Uh, so that was one comment that, that was uh, made. Um, there was also a, a comment uh, about the policing, and that was mentioned uh, in, in this conversation, but the policing that happens or the informal policing that happens at community gardens. Uh, and so how do we create, you know, a better sort of like atmosphere of, of you know, collegial uh, of working uh, within the same sort of space. Um, and then also I think Falani uh, mentioned this as well. This is the final comment I'll mention here. Uh, there's a need to create stories about people who use community gardens and have ideas that tie in with the making uh, with making the right kind of change. So creating those stories about people and getting those stories out there. Perfect, I appreciate it. I kept you all longer than I wanted to. I know you all have uh, things to do. I, I hope you all found this to be as valuable as I found it to be. I, I really appreciate you all sharing your insights and experiences. All the folks on, on Facebook and on this Zoom who joined us, I appreciate you carving out some time to be with us this evening. I, you know, I want to do more of these types of conversations. Um, you know, every time I get the experience to come, you know, visit with Arani Webb or, or with Che, I haven't gotten the chance, but Falani, I'm going to be 
up there at Coolidge with you at some point when, when I get an invitation. I'd love to join you up there to meet yes. some Yes, we, we up there on Wednesday, so come up there um, one or two. We up there in the dirt, so okay. please come. Okay, no, I've appreciated it. This has been extraordinarily insightful for me. I appreciate all the great questions that came in. Uh, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. The comments were very insightful as well. Uh, but this won't be the last time that we take up this issue. I want to do something similar to talk about some of the other things that I think the city's invested in that some people don't view for them, like bike lanes, like uh, you know dog parks. Uh, this is our city. Uh, whether you have, have been here for, for three months or you've been here for 30 years, uh, like it sounds like we all have, although, Felani, you're probably younger than that, but, you know, this no, is- No, what? Thank this, you. This, <laughs> this um. is our city. And, and, and I want everybody to be involved in every aspect of it, whether it is urban agriculture uh, or something that perhaps is new to you. Let's have these conversations. Let's get past our differences. And I bet we're going to find out how much we have in common. Uh, I, I see it happen all the time in my work. And so I do appreciate you all. Uh, real quick, 10 seconds. Anything you want to share with people, Ronnie, about what you're doing, just so people know? Nah, I just was looking at the comments. Um... And it's like watching Instagram Live, the one of those influences that man is popping. So I just want to see more of this energy coming on and council member and your team, man, you know, Silas, Jonathan, everybody over there, man, Miss Flowers. I just appreciate, man, everything y'all doing to elevate this issue. I think this is the next steps um, as, as our leaders really taking a deeper look um, into this. So I'm just thankful. And then I'm just want to be, I'm honored um, with the panelists that, that I'm surrounded by. So Absolutely. thank you. 10 seconds, real brief. Shay, any closing thoughts? Anything you want to yeah, share? Same, same thing. I mean, uh, Councilman McBethy, thank you so much. Uh, like I said, I always wanted to meet Ronnie. Heard a lot about him. Um, Alani, good to meet you. And I just can't wait to just join with you and uh, find out how we can make things better for young folks coming up and get them more interested, interested in uh, their, uh, you know, the spiritual culture of agriculture. Awesome. Awesome. Falani, 10 seconds. Final yeah. thoughts. Look, I'm just feeling so just inspired by learning about Che and just, I can't wait to sit with you and Ronnie, you are just on it. And I like your authenticity too, because it's even about the accent, you know, and that's how we talk to each other. So I, I'm looking forward to getting out in the field and doing this field work, you know, with you all. Thank you so much, Councilman McDuffie for hosting this conversation is needed. Without these spaces, I probably wouldn't have never um, ran into Che. You just never know. So thank you so much for doing this. Um, it was an honor and I look forward to the partnerships um, that may come from this. Absolutely, well said. Each of you, I appreciate your time. Um, we're gonna end it right there. And I look forward to, to spending some time with you. Hopefully at some point we can all get together in person uh, to, to, to really mix it up a little bit too. So thank you all. Appreciate Thank you. Enjoy you. the rest of the evening. All right. Thank you. Peace. Bye -bye. Peace. Thank you.